Today we have an incredible panel, fabulous panelists, and an extremely important topic. We're talking about the fourth industrial revolution, particularly technologies around artificial intelligence. We'll be talking about how AI has grown, the areas where it's actually led to extraordinary innovation during the pandemic, the areas where maybe it's underperformed. We're going to talk about private-public partnerships, which this panel is particularly appropriately designed for, and we'll also be talking about climate change. The other day at the World Economic Forum, John Kerry mentioned, discussing something Bill Gates had said, that we might need a technological miracle to get out of the climate change catastrophe. So we'll see where we are, where progress is right now. So fantastic panel, big conversations, great topic. Let me introduce the panelists. We'll get going. Remember, you can ask your questions. They'll be fed to me through the Zoom chat, and I will ask the panelists then. So starting off with Yvonne Duque, he is the president of Colombia. He's been the president since 2018, a member of the Democratic Center Party. He's been a major proponent of developing the tech sector in Colombia. Under his leadership, the Colombian government published a draft framework for ethical AI in November of last year. And I just learned in the green room that he's all in favor of getting an edition of Wired in Colombia, which I take as a very, very good sign. Oyvind Erickson is the chief executive officer of Ocker. <laughs> been running that amazing company for a while and in partnership with the World Economic Forum, the Ocker Group has been instrumental in the development of Norway's center for the fourth industrial revolution, the Ocean Data Platform, which is a collaborative data sharing platform to which data from 220,000 marine research expeditions since 1890 have been uploaded just in the past year. Brad Smith is the president of Microsoft. He's been at Microsoft in a range of roles for over 27 years. You've probably seen him on Davos panels before because he is absolutely fabulous on every panel. He became president in 2015. He leads more than 1,400, uh, sorry, leads a team of more than 1,400 business, legal, and corporate affairs professionals in 56 countries. And he's president of a tech company that has a great valuation because it actually sells products, not because the stock has been pumped up on Reddit. Julie Sweet is the chief executive officer of Accenture USA and my favorite fact of all my panel introductions, she is ranked first, not second, not third, not ninth, she is ranked first on Fortune's list of most powerful women for 2020. So an amazing panel, fabulous conversation ahead. Let's get going. President Duque, you, I read an interview recently you did with the Council on Foreign Relations from October where you talked about the importance of technology and the importance of AI in helping Colombia's economy recover from COVID and grow whenever we are finally finding our way out of this catastrophe. So tell me the areas where you expect to see the most interesting growth and what you expect to happen. And let's get going there. And then we'll dig into some of the complex debates around this. President well, thank Duque. you so much, Nick. It's a great honor for me to be in this panel. And I also welcome the presence of such a distinguished group. Let me uh, try to frame what we are trying to accelerate in Colombia. The first thing is we believe technology has to be the driver of building back better. And we also believe that this is the right uh, avenue to provide um, human capital next frontiers. So how do we do it? The first thing is we have to build smart regulation. So we have combined regulation for entrepreneurship and technology. On entrepreneurship, we decided to have no income tax for the first six years for technology entrepreneurs with a minimum amount of investment and a minimum amount of jobs to be created. We also developed regulation for fintech, golf tech, education technology, and health technology. And we have become leaders on financial inclusion using digital technologies. The third element is we have to train the human talent. And that's why we launched a program to train 100,000 programmers by August 2022. And we also are thinking on smart infrastructure. And that's why our plan is to have by August next year, 70% of all the Colombian population with fast speed internet. And we are providing fast speed internet to communities that are, have not had access to technology. And last but not least in the, in the element is the ethical framework. We were the first Spanish speaking country to open a fourth industrial revolution with the World Economic Forum. And we are now putting in place 
the ethical framework for AI. That means we have to value AI for the privilege it brings to the whole world. But at the same time, we have to be clear that managing information and managing algorithms need to be aligned with an ethical framework so that information is used for the best purpose. And I should mention that the next step where we want to get is also to combine all these technologies with the evolution of the creative industries in Colombia. We have now the most competitive framework for audiovisual, for uh, digital animation in Latin America. If we combine all these uh, elements, we want to make Colombia the Silicon Valley of Latin America so that every single investment in technology, when it looks to the region, sees Colombia as the first choice. And I'm glad that Brad Smith is also joining us today because one of the elements that we're trying to push very hard is to have data analytics centers. If Microsoft opened one in Chile, we want to be the next in the region. And we already have Amazon Web Services doing big investments in Colombia. Accenture is also working on AI technology. So I believe Colombia today is the most competitive place in the region because we have combined the regulation, the entrepreneurship framework, uh, human capital. And last but not least, we're putting also resources in terms of venture capital and in terms of, of uh, supporting capital to entrepreneurs in the technology sector all over the country. That is a uh, fabulous answer. And I guess, Brad, you were, you were named there. So let me ask you the follow-up, which is, will Microsoft be moving to Columbia? And if not, why not? And then more seriously, what is it that the rest of the world needs to do to make sure that their tech sectors become as vibrant as America's? Because it is still true that the largest tech companies are all still from a very small part of one country. What does the world have to do? Well, we've been bullish uh, on Colombia for a long time, and I think in a lot of interesting ways. Uh, you know, Colombia has been actually uh, you know, more forward leaning than the United States in certain regulatory areas, you know, such as what it takes to, to bring broadband to, to more people. Um, but, you know, I, I think, Nick, what we're really doing right now is living in a time where, you know, so much real world progress really requires that we weave together new AI based technologies with you know, cloud based services. Uh, and with data analytics, and you, you put these three together. And you know, it's easy to look at the United States and know that the country will continue to be you know, in the top tier, probably the global leader for a lot of this investment. Um, but more than ever, I think it's really you know, spreading around the world, in large part because people recognize that it is this combination that's the key to solving almost every problem we care about. Um, yeah, I'm just struck because, you know, here we are the last week in January, uh, and yeah, the biggest problem the world needs to solve right now is getting more vaccines manufactured, distributed, and into people's arms around the world. And, you know, when you start thinking about that, you know, you start with the proposition that this is this extraordinary success of the biotechnology and pharmaceutical sector, and it is. But in many ways, it really speaks to the importance of these digital technologies as well. Um, you know, when I look at what it takes to get shots into people's arms through a supply chain, uh, we're seeing AI put to use. You got to pre-register you know, billions of people around the world so they know whether they're eligible for a vaccine. Uh, we're seeing AI play a role, AI chatbots, to walk people through online so they know whether they're eligible. You need to do massive sk scheduling uh, of people so they can get an appointment. And this is where Accenture and, and, and Microsoft are working together you know, to help institutions scale up their scheduling systems and combine it with online data entry in advance so people don't have to spend 25 minutes filling out paperwork when they go to get a vaccination. You need to have real-time data analytics that let governments know whether shots are being administered and to whom they're being administered. Are they reaching the people who are eligible? Are they reaching marginalized communities? And here we're seeing uh, governments around the world you know, really build on the kind of data dashboards that you know, we and others have created to tell the public what's going on and really create a tool for government itself. So you know, what is, I think, interesting today is that what started in the United States, what has spread to some other countries is really a global phenomenon. 
and it's being embraced by governments, nonprofits, and businesses alike. That is a, that's a fabulous answer. Let me, let, me go to, let me go to Julie here because this gets at one of the things I've been wondering about, and it's a, a big question. I'm going to ask it kind of with two parts, but one of the questions people have about AI right now is what is it, how much is it actually helping, right? There's a study that came out from MIT in October, November, saying that only 11% of the companies that had you know, fully invested in AI had seen, I think it was outsized returns from the AI. And so if that is a presumption, then let's look at the COVID problem where it looks like well, the vaccine development relied on AI very little. Is the vaccine rollout gonna really rely on AI? How much does AI matter right now, both to the world and to companies and to the particular problem right now that Brad just described as the most important problem of the world, which is how we get vaccines into everybody's arms? That's a great question, but I am going to put a plug in for Columbia first, uh, like Brad, because we're very proud of our over almost a thousand people in Columbia. So thank you, President Duque. It's uh, it's uh, we have an amazing, amazing and talented people there. Uh, so it, it's a great question. So so maybe the first answer is we're at the beginning of AI actually being able to reach its full potential, whether it's in you know what we're seeing now with you. Know, Bio, you know, biochemistry and the development of medicines to changing the way we're alive because it's actually pervasive. I mean, if you're using your phone, AI is changing your life every day, right? So when I say it's at the beginning, it's because the potential of AI is so great. But AI isn't a destination, it's about how you use it. And it was really important what Brad talked about. And it's one of the things that we work together so strongly is you can't have AI unless you have good data. It's hard to have enough data to change the world unless you're in the cloud, right? And at the end of the day, you actually need thoughtful use cases and experiences around that. And that's why when Brad talked about it, you'll notice he didn't talk about them separately, but how we put them together, right? And then around that, it's the technology and the people. So if you think about what we're doing around vaccines and the solution that we've built together, it, it has to have the government actor as well as you know, the individual and the private actors, right? They're, they're together. So it's not a technology solution, it's the ability to integrate those things. And so when you think about AI, don't think of it as a destination, but at, about an enabler that's only beginning to reach its full potential. So will we see more medicines and breakthroughs through the ability to use AI? Yes. But if you talk to the pharma companies, what they would say is, in order to do that, we have to be in the cloud, have the access to the data and think differently about um, where the data is coming, having diverse populations, for example. And so it, it is more complex than, you know, is AI, you know, what are they doing? And, and in fact, if you think about like, I'm not troubled by the fact that the stats around, are we getting the value? Because in fact, over the last several years, what you've really been seeing is a lot of experimentation. We're, we're at the beginning of a decade where that experimentation is now reaching, starting to reach scale and having an impact. And if we work together well, right, it can, it can be truly explosive. And I don't think it's gonna take the decade that I thought before COVID, I think you're gonna see an acceleration of the value over the next few years. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. You need to have these things working together. You need to be in the cloud. You need to have your data properly organized and you need to have AI working as a tool on that, which actually leads to something, Orvin, that I was thinking about when I read one of the interviews that you gave recently. And you were talking, as I think it was an interview in October, and you said industries like energy, manufacturing, shipping, and terminals continue to battle with extraordinary inertia on digital change. Meaning, as I read it, you know, it's much harder to do exactly what Julie is talking about in certain industries. Talk to me a little bit about the way that at some point in the huge portfolio you manage, you have solved one of these data problems and you've taken an industry with inertia and enabled the data to be organized in such a way that AI could work to its potential. I think this is a very important discussion because as individuals, our lives and the way we're communicating changed more than a decade ago, uh, ago due to the um, smartphone. But the reality is that a significant part of um, the industry has not yet had its smartphone moment. 
And the main reason why um, uh, we have not been able to take full uh, advantage of new digital tool is exactly what was uh, described, that uh, the data um, are still locked in silos, in separate systems, and, um, and uh, very hard to liberate um, uh, and uh, hard to contextualize and make available to take full effect of uh, uh, AI and other uh, applications. So. Uh, but um, uh, things uh, are changing, and um, from my perspective, uh, 2020 was obviously a different year, but it uh, was also a transformational year in this respect, because helped by cloud and other technologies, um, we're about to resolve the fundamental um, uh, uh, problem about the data uh, and be able to uh, uh, make available high-quality data um, uh, uh, for uh, to take full effect of new applications. So um, I'm quite optimistic that um, um, also for um, uh, asset heavy industries like um, uh, those you mentioned, uh, we will see a step change going forward, both with respect to uh, efficiency, uh, but also um, uh, uh, as a, a very important tool to operate uh, those industries uh, in a more sustainable way going forward. That, that makes a lot of sense, and it gets me to a big topic I want to ask maybe multiple people on this, this panel about, which is when we talk about one of the stories of the coronavirus crisis will be the, extraordinarily, the extraordinary technological transformation that has occurred because of what's happened, because we are all forced into our homes, because we started to collect more data, because we stopped interacting in person, because it all happened on Zoom and it was all recorded and it could all be analyzed. And because we've had to push forward certain industries like telemedicine and online education. The question is, what are the areas where we have seen the most surprising booms because of the combination of tech post-corona? What are the areas where a year from now we're going to look and say, wow, corona really caused an extraordinary transformation that we didn't see coming? What are the things we're just starting to see now? Um, but that we haven't seen yet in the crisis. Maybe I'll go to Brad or Julie on this one first. Well, <clears throat> let me start, Nick, with something that, you know, like all things, I'm not sure it, it's a shock or a surprise, but I, I think it is definitely grabbing the world's attention. Um, yeah, look, there will undoubtedly be people who will watch something like this and say, well, you know, of course the Davos crowd uh, did well. We could all work from home. We all had our broadband connections. And it's easy to forget that even in a country like the United States, you know, more than half of the people who were lucky enough to keep their job uh, didn't have the luxury of working from home. And you know, what we started talking about a year ago, uh, would this be a V-shaped recovery or an L-shaped recovery, I do think has become this K-shaped recovery where you know, some have done better and others are being more left behind. And, and I think that really is the, 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 the thing that should probably grab our attention the most. And then we ask ourselves, well, what is it that it will take to move everybody up and not just some? And, and I think it's three things. Number one, it is broadband. You know, we saw before the pandemic that you know, broadband was a real ticket to the future. Um, but we've seen just how glaringly it is to leave some people you know, without that ticket. Uh, you know, we're seeing, you know, underprivileged kids, uh, you know, just literally not be able to attend school. Uh, you know, we're seeing, you know, rural communities, you know, continue to be left behind. They were before. Now we see it more clearly. So, I, yeah, I just think if there's one thing that we start with, it's a resolve to eliminate the broadband gap over the next few years, which I think new technology will enable us to do. And then there's the two other things that need to be added, access to devices and access to skills. Uh, and you know, I think if we can put these together and really understand in each country, where is the gap? How do we close it? You know, this may be one of the great pieces of learning, not because we didn't know it before, but because the whole world didn't see it with the clarity that we all see it today. President Duque, have you seen signs of a K-shaped recovery in Colombia? And what are you, what are you doing about, about that? Well, 
Uh, let me uh, try to uh, try to connect uh, both uh, questions, Nick. Uh, on the one hand, I think we have reached important levels of, of recovery, although there's still much to go. I think our the economy was badly hidden. We ended up 2019 with the largest, um, with the biggest economic growth in the last five years, and we grew above the regional average, world average, OECD average. But definitely, I think we're we're expecting a negative growth of minus six point seven maybe in 2020. Nevertheless, since uh, June, I think we started seeing recovery trends that are important and um, and we got in December to uh, pre-pandemic unemployment levels are very close there. But this year is going to be very important because this has to be the massive vaccination and the safe recovery. But I think you mentioned something very interesting in your previous question. Which are the sectors that you think are accelerating? I remember Richard has saying that this is going to be the acceleration of history. In Colombia, I'm going to mention four that are really making a big change. The, the number one, financial inclusion through fintech. Since we had to put together programs to get to the poorest of the poor in a fast way, we did it through technology. And we got to more than 3.5 million families that never got a, a transfer from the government to attend the circumstance. That was very important. The second element is now you see all the banks moving to more digital wallets. So this is going to be the time of fintech. And we're having new uh, fintech investments in Colombia from banks that were created all over Latin America, basically digital, and they're starting to compete. And that competition, I think, is going to create more smart products for the citizens. The second thing is telemedicine. We pass from 400,000 consultations to millions of consultations that are done right now through internet. So the managing of, of, uh, of, uh, of the system, the information in the system, the way doctors can connect to people that are in, in, uh, in far places of the country, it's very important. And that's gonna be a massive acceleration. Number three is education. But I also wanna put a red light here. Yes, it's very important that we have moved to more virtual education, but we have to acknowledge that for the sake of mental health of children, there has to be an alternancy. There has to be presential education and virtual education. I obviously believe that the virtual component is going to make a dramatic change and is going to change also the habits of parenthood. And we all have to learn from that. But it's very important that the acceleration of education technology also has to be based on a balance with presential education. And last but not least, I also believe that cybersecurity is going to have the fastest acceleration ever because we're using, we're transferring more information, we're having more meetings, we're transferring sensible information, we're having access to databases. So I think this is gonna be the major acceleration of cybersecurity. And that's why in Colombia, we have decided to launch a public policy on cybersecurity. And if I may wrap up how Colombia is adapting to all this, the framework that we have built on fintech, cybersecurity, and also AI, IoT, cloud computing, is because we understand that if we take the wave, the way the wave is coming, we're going to take advantage so that this becomes the fastest acceleration of youth employment in Colombia, building talent with the right education for the moment. And that's why we made the big bet to train 100 thousand programmers by August 22. And I feel that that is also going to make Colombia the place in Latin America with the best prepared talent for the demand of workers in this type of industries. Wonderful. Well, you know, the, the question about uh, education at home is one that may be made evident to everybody watching this panel because uh, my three children are here and the 10 year old has a trombone class shortly. So if you hear a trombone, that's what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, Julia Oyvin, let's, let's do a follow up on this, which is so uh, President Duque just mentioned four areas, fintech, cybersecurity, telemedicine, online education as areas where he's seen spectacular growth, where he expects to see continued spectacular growth. Are there others besides those four? Have you seen surprising, interesting areas of growth that will be important as we recover from the COVID catastrophe? 
I mean, do you want to go first? Some... Yeah, I'm happy to start. Um, I think what we have been through the last year has changed uh, the way business leaders look upon uh, risk and risk management also by application of new software technology. Um, and uh, being responsible for a large industrial uh, group like Arker, uh, I'm pretty sure that um, uh, remote operations and um, mitigation by digital tools of different risk factors will uh, be a high priority going forward than what it has been in the past. Um, so um, uh, I also think that um, uh, industry at large will make a step change with respect to application of um, uh, uh, software solutions and AI um, in order to um, mitigate the risk uh, at, at large. Right. So I'll make my prediction. So back in 2013, we were the first company to say every business would be a digital business. And Brad will remember that. We like CIOs argued, industry said you're crazy. You know, today we were already headed there, but COVID made very clear, right? Technology is the lifeline, every business, and you hear it in every discussion we, you know, really had here, right? So my next prediction is that sustainability is the new digital. And uh, this wasn't obvious when pandemic, the pandemic hit. You'll remember at the WEF, we were talking about, will we have a setback as we just come off of Davos in that jet last January with sustainability in the broad sense from climate to inequality to, you know, reskilling and privacy. And people were worried that the economic impact would mean that people wouldn't spend, et cetera. And I think you're seeing the exact opposite because as people are rebuilding, replatforming in the cloud, investing, there's a huge interest in doing so sustainably. Consumers want it, the um, employees want it. Our research that we just did in Europe said that companies who embrace both technology and sustainability are two and a half times more likely to be tomorrow's leaders. And so I think this is something that has an economic case and the pandemic and the collective experience of what the pandemic has done has really driving different behavior. Uh, and so I'm very hopeful that when we have this dialogue in 2025, that we'll be talking about how that every business is a sustainable business. And certainly if you look at what Acker and, and Microsoft have been doing for years, this is part of your values. This is something you've already been embedding it. But uh, just to give you one quick stat, a year and a half ago when we talked about artificial intelligence, our research said 60% increase in spending and only 3% of companies were actually reskilling their people. And our strategy today, which is around creating 360 degree value and helping companies reskill, we're having a totally different conversation post pandemic. So every business, uh, you know, sustainability is going to be the next digital and every business will be a sustainable business. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's, uh, let's stay on that for a second. And it ties into one of the questions that have come in from the audience. Maybe Brad will go to you. Microsoft has clearly made sustainability a, a huge, a huge goal. I saw last year, Satya made an extraordinary ambition that I believe you may well be ahead of target of becoming, I think it's carbon net negative by 2030. I mean, just a, a tre tremendous goal that you, I think, will probably hit ahead of schedule. What to you are the technologies in the fourth industrial revolution or the ways that AI can be used that will be most important to do right between now and 2025 when, if Julie is correct, and I think she surely will be correct, uh, sustainability is the most important thing for everybody at the World Economic Forum. What are the, what are the technologies that will matter the most in the next four years? Well, I, I, let me answer that, Nick, by just sort of talking about where we are and then what we're seeing play out. Um, you know, I, I think you know, the, the ocean data platform that Ocker has been championing and that we've been supporting with the WEF is, is one key example of just you know, how you're using data and AI to you know, streamline ocean shipping routes or we're seeing other projects to, to stop you know, illegal fishing. But let's talk about climate and carbon uh, for a minute. Um, we just released our one-year update this morning, and to me, there were two things that were most notable about it in terms of learning. First, we you know, showed that at, at Microsoft, we had reduced our carbon emissions by 6% over the past year. 
Uh, and you know, to me, there's a recipe that has clearly emerged for what it takes to help the world, especially businesses, you know, reduce carbon emissions. It's economic incentives that I think in part are coming from what Julie described. I mean, I think the full weight of capitalism is being put behind the drive to reduce carbon. The second is standardized measurement. We need a global objective accepted standard for how people measure carbon emissions. Uh, and the third is technology-based measurement systems. Yeah, you know, that in some ways you know starts with IoT-based devices, uh, but does you know uh, ladder up to the kind of data analytics so that we know and can provide on an audited basis for every company whether progress is being made. So that's how I think we reduce carbon emissions. But the second thing we need to do, I think, is even more daunting. We need to build a new market that doesn't exist today and an industry that doesn't exist today for carbon removal. The other thing we announced today is that we purchased 1.3 million metric tons of carbon removal around the world. This is the largest purchase that any company has ever made. It's a giant leap and yet it is a simultaneously you know, like the first step of an infant. We'll look back and say, oh my gosh, this was the smallest step we could have imagined. But what it really shows is we need to build a marketplace where those who want to build an industry to remove carbon from the atmosphere and put it under the ground or, or increase you know, you know, carbon in the soil you know, can go out and do it. They can sell that service. Others can buy it. Uh, and that too you know, it needs standardized measurement. It needs data analytics everywhere. Uh, it needs auditable standards. But frankly, the other thing it needs, and AI I do believe will play a part in this, is it needs massive invention. Uh, invention specifically in carbon removal technologies. 99% of what you know, we're removing this year is really nature-based and blended solutions. Just a modest part you know, is technology-based. Uh, like direct air capture. And you know, this is the industry that we have to have by you know, big global standards by 2050. And I think it's an area where we're going to need government uh, investment in basic research to advance. That makes a lot of sense. It's something that we've been trying to cover as much as we can in, in Wired. My only, uh, my only disagreement with that, Brad, is I'm not sure the full weight of capitalism is behind sustainability, maybe half the weight of capitalism. I'll, is I'll, uh, I'll reach you halfway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have, a, we have a, a series of fabulous questions from the audience. I'm going to read one from um, Mukesh Dalal, who is the chief AI officer at Stanley Black & Decker. Mukesh asks, a question for all panelists. What should governments or WEF kinds of platforms do differently or more for massively scaling and accelerating more meaningful AI benefits to everyone. What do we need to do that we're not doing right now? What are we doing wrong? If, if you want, I'll, I'll, uh, what I'll try to do, uh, Nick, is connect that very interesting question with the issue that you raised uh, for Brad on sustainability. Because I think that the greatest challenge that we face is how do we use all AI development to be more assertive in the way that we fight climate change? Because this is the issue of our time. And uh, when we look at a, at a country like Colombia, 50% of our territory is basically tropical jungle. 35% is, uh, is in the Amazonic basin. So uh, the most important technology to capture CO2 emissions is trees. And that's why we have decided to join Salesforce, Mark Benioff initiative called the One Trillion Trees Initiative that is bringing the private sector and the public sector all over the world to get into that purpose. In our case, we made the commitment to plant 180 million trees by 2022. So what we need is to have the right and intelligent measurement so that we know that day by day we're getting to the target. So that brings AI as a very important tool. The second thing, we are making a big revolution in Colombia when it comes to non-conventional, uh, uh, when it comes to non uh, to to renewable non-conventional sectors, especially solar and wind. In terms of solar and wind, we're going to pass from 30 megawatts that we had when my administration began to more than 2,500 by the end of my administration next year. 
And we're seeing the solar parks growing all over the country. We're seeing now a wind park that will be open by the end of the year, which is the biggest in the country. And the usage of AI, I think, is also going to be very important so that we take the better advantage in terms of on on how do we get the maximizer precipitation and we maximize the wind flow but also storage we're open up the first auction for massive storage of energy in colombia in the next month and that storage also requires iot it requires ai so that we maximize the capability smart vehicles and 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 um, and sustainable mobility We have, in, in the year of the pandemic, where the beginning began in 2020, thanks to the uh, electric car bill that we approved, the sales of electric cars grew by 80%. And that is very meaningful. And something that I have been pressuring in, in a good way is how do we connect the, the, the massive conscience on reducing individual carbon footprint? How do we can use technology so that we measure if we're doing it correctly individually? Because we're talking about reuse, reuse, recycle, circular economy, but having the right data and the right measurement is going to be very important. So linking all this with the, with the, with the question that, that, was, that, that you raised from the audience, it, we have to see what's the goal for, by 2030. Colombia has said we want to reduce by 51% our CO2 emissions and we want to get to carbon neutrality by 2050. Technology is going to be the right instrument to measure all this. And maybe what's, what's still to be built is how do we get from the individual measurement of our own footprint, carbon footprint, to understand how massively we can, we can monitor the information day by day so that we really meet the target by 2030. Great. Um, a very good audience question that ties together. Uh, or Brad, did you want to jump in there? I would just say also to answer the question, just real briefly, I think there's three things that every government can and should do on AI. One, build on Julie's point, open up data sets so your own people and companies have access to public data to build on. Two, invest in digital skilling programs, especially at the higher education level for AI, so that your own people will have the skills to go to work and get the jobs that are being created. And three, uh, build on what the, the president said earlier, um, have high ethical standards as a country and enact laws that will put safeguards and guardrails around AI. The WEF itself is doing some really important work in this space. And I, I think the time to address this is now uh, when it is, as Julie said early, uh, earlier, the early days of AI. Um, I'm going to add four. Protect and support your journalists who will help hold companies to account and make sure that everybody is following up on their commitments. Um, we have a great audience question um, that I'm going to tweak slightly and direct towards Julie, which is, do the, the, the company comes from Lauren Pfeiffer, Global Shaper, SF. Um, do the companies you work with have best practices for training AI-powered systems in a climate-friendly way? Large models are requiring more power for training, so how can we offset this? Set up training facilities and geographies with eco-friendly uh, energy policies? That's a great question. Ties together a couple of our big themes. Yeah, I mean, I, I probably approach it slightly differently. Um, so what, what, where I think we are in companies right now is that there's commitment, but there's not yet enough linkage with those in the company who truly understand various sustainability issues and the business runners, right? And so for example, in supply chain, you have people, supply chain massively disruptive in the pandemic, lots of investment accelerated in things like data and analytics. Uh, you can, when you invest that to better run your supply chain, build in data sets and algorithms that will allow you to identify human trafficking and child labor, right? But oftentimes those who care about those things, right, are not the same ones who are making the decisions and understanding how quickly they're going to do and seeing the art of the possible. And so it's a great question because it's really about saying, embedding what we call responsible business into every part of the business. And so for, for example, now at Accenture, when we are um, creating new offerings and you know, solving industry problems, we specifically look at, is there a reskilling opportunity? Is there a sustainability issue? And how would we embed it? When we do cost 
uh, takeout, which is obviously very popular now. We don't just say, here's how you reduce your energy uh, costs. Here's how you can switch to renewables at the same time. And so my message to companies around the world and particularly CEOs is the only way that we'll do this faster is if you bring those parts of the company together. It is something, again, that my fellow panelists have done really well at their companies because they think about sustainability as a part of their business today. It's, a, it's, it's both a part of the competitiveness, but it's embedded. But that's where there's a long way to go. And it's one of the reasons we switched our strategy to say we're going to bring this so we bring the question at least in everything we do. I think you went on mute, Nick. Uh, uh, President Duque. No, so, something briefly that I just want to, you know, put in the table to to pick the, everybody's brains here. And it's a concept uh, that we are launching with the World Economic Forum. And it's the concept of biodiverse cities, which are cities that get to protect biodiversity and that are pretty much aware on all the, the, the efforts that the private sector, the public sector and, and, and individuals have to commit. And I consider that the usage of technology in terms of being able to measure and to protect and to connect objectives for 2030, for 2050 or earlier in terms of carbon neutrality, I think is going to be very important. I want to put that concept because with the private sector, I think we can accelerate this process. In our case, getting to a 51% reduction of CO2 emissions by 2030 implies that everybody adds to the objective and especially the private sector with the right regulation because I consider carbon credit markets are going to be very important and reaching carbon neutrality with the right economic incentives is going to be the driver in the next, in next years. Well, then do you want to follow up on that and how you're thinking about sustainability has changed in recent months? I know this is something that you've spent a lot of time on. I fully agree with the president, what the president now said about the price on carbon. And, uh, and, but uh, in Norway, the government put uh, 200 US dollars per ton uh, as a price of carbon going forward. And uh, an immediate reaction in the business society was how can we turn that into an incentive to fast track uh, and, uh, uh, technologies and solutions which can reduce emissions. So it had an immediate effect despite the fact that uh, the 200 US dollar per ton will uh, be it will be built up gradually up to 2030. So uh, in addition to that, I think um, uh, um, uh, 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 this uh, question about sustainability is obviously an, a very broad and a big issue. But if you break it down and make it a part of your company culture, uh, my experience is that it's really a motivating factor for uh, each and individual uh, uh, employee. And um, uh, that's um, uh, uh, what will, has created a lot of uh, results already in our group. Last but not least, uh, don't underestimate public-private co collaboration. Uh, and uh, we have some, already some great examples in the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, both in Colombia, as the president said, and in Norway, where we're collaborating with uh, uh, Microsoft and other partners. Right. Well, we are out of time. That is a marvelous note to end on. Thank you so much to the panelists. Thank you so much to the audience. I felt like we had a superb and illuminating conversation that actually was full of optimism, which is a good thing for 2021. So thank you so much to everybody who joined in and thank you to a fabulous panel.